And so today I'm going to tell you about Jesus in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 21. And um, you're going to see some characteristics of Jesus as we have throughout the Gospels um, that you need to know. Uh, we need to know because sometimes the church painted Jesus in the wrong light. We had him way too tough. We had him way too mad. And then sometimes we didn't have him angry at all. He was all God and all human, and he had every expression you and I have. He got hungry. He got tired. He got angry. He got excited. Why? Because he was all man but all God. The, the Bible says the word became flesh and he dwelt among us. We're called to be Christians so when we learn who he is and how he responds to things, then it helps us in our walk. Amen? And so we're going to jump in here and the, the first one uh, is, first section of text is uh, chapter 21 verse 1 and Pastor Sheila is going to read for me and she's going to read down uh, through verse 7, please. Now when they drew near Jerusalem and came to Bethphage at the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village opposite you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Loose them and bring them to me. And if anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord has need of them. And immediately he will send them. All this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, lowly and sitting on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. So the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them. They brought the donkey and the colt, laid their clothes on them, and set him on them. And a very great multitude spread their clothes on the road. Others cut down branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Oh. Then the multitudes who oh, went... Oh, oh. Sorry. She's like, he ain't interrupting me. I'm going for it. <laughs> I don't blame you, sis, because I usually am. Let's stop at verse 7 here. We'll, we'll go back and read verse 8. This is an amazing story. Sometimes we just skim over it, but I'm going to show you some things in here. If you can adapt it in your life, it'll change your life. Now, I don't, I don't confess that stuff too much because I don't want to set up high expectations, but this is the Word of God. This will change your life. They went, the disciples went and got a donkey and the colt from the guy and just went and took it. And he said, if anybody says anything, just tell them I need it. Some would say, what, are they still in the donkey and the colt? No, because we've got to understand God told them to go do it. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. When I give tithes, I don't pay God. I return back to him what's already his. Yeah. The 90% that he lets me steward becomes better than the 100% if I tried to steward it. Why? Because I'm not in stewardship. I'm in ownership. Ooh, that's good. The only difference in you and me, I heard it first just then. Don't think I've ever said that. But think about it. When you think you own it and you don't return the tithe to the Lord, it becomes ownership instead of stewardship. He called us to be stewards. Amen. Working with us. My mother used to say this. Why do you keep putting money in bags with holes in it? Because it wasn't tithing. And it wasn't working. I had more potential for it to work. I was hanging out with millionaires making millions all the time. I mean, I was going to conventions. These guys was driving Rolls Royces. I was eating hot dogs trying to live. Nothing wrong with a hot dog, but they're one of the cheapest things you can buy and cook. Why? I wasn't doing what the word commanded. It wasn't a law. It was a proposition. People say, oh, tithing's under the law. I don't know why I'm going here. Somebody needs to hear it, I guess, because I didn't in the first service. Tithing's under the law. No, it's not. The tithe come before the law was ever given. Abraham gave a tenth to Melchizedek before God ever gave the law. It's a proposition. Invite me into your finances, and I'll show you something. And I want to testify this morning. I want to tell you about my Jesus. He showed me something. Yeah. yeah. He showed me how to get wealth and no sorrow. Yeah. Phil in that movie the other day said, if you'll please the Lord and do what the Lord says, he'll bless you. 
Now, that's coming from a man that's made millions on a duck call. It's a little piece of wood or plastic. He gave him the power, the creative means whereby to obtain wealth. And he done it, according to the movie, the moment he surrendered to God. So your moment may be today. Don't withhold anything from God. Give it to God and your moment may come. His moment come through his, one of his kids. I don't know if it's Willie or which one it was. But he's blowing this kazoo or some kind of instrument and his, he's about to eat supper. And as soon as he blew it, he, it, revelation come. He started taking that thing apart and making a duck call. His wife said, you're going to have to buy him another one. I'd say he could buy him several of them. Give you the power to get wealth. Why did I go there? You needed to hear it, I guess. But anyway, how many of you needed to hear it? Go ahead. Let's keep, yeah, yeah, praise God. All right, so he told them to go. And they went and they brought the donkey and the colt. The, Matthew's is the only gospel that mentions the, the, the donkey and the foal, the, the donkey and the colt. The reason being Matthew is being concise. He is quoting verbatim Zechariah 9.9. 9. The other one, same principle. Jesus came in on the, on the colt. Why was he doing that? To show his humanity to the world. Sometimes people say, well, I would do this. You, you say we can do what's in the Bible, but that was God. He was the son of God. Yes, he was. But if you miss the point, he was all human. That is going to kill your faith. That's going to bring in unbelief. What kind of unbelief? It, you, the unbelief that you can do it. He, Jesus is going to teach us here in an illustrated parable here in just a minute. And it's all leading up to that. But he, he's telling us that we can do the things he does and greater things. Wow. Years ago, the game, one of the game changers in my life as a Christian was when I went through prayer school. Uh, Pastor Susan and Judy Hall was teaching it, and um, it, it, one of those states, statements was made that made my mind go tilt. I just, wow. And I'm going to try to quote it like they did. Don't go to God with your list. Go to God and get his list. What is God obligated to perform? Whatever he speaks. He said, I am not a man that I should lie. If God says it, he'll do it. But if I go to God and say, hey, here's what I want. Could you bless it? He, may will, he still will bless it within what means he can. But if it's not aligned with his will and not aligned with the helping whatever situation he needs, he's not obligated to it. But when God speaks something, he's obligated to it. Why? He obligated himself to it. Yeah. He said, when I couldn't find anybody else to swear to, I swore to my own name. He said, I put my word above my name. So when you get God's word on something, you got something. These disciples had his word. They went and took the man's donkey and gold. You butter hear from God, you go to doing that. Because in that day, I mean, some, you get killed. Even in the wild, wild west, you take a man's horse, they're going to shoot you. They're going to hang you. Why? Because you took his means of livelihood. You, you really cripple somebody. That's how they got around. And, but what happened? They, they, they brought it to him, and he rides it in. We'll pick up right there. Verse 8, please. And a very great multitude spread their clothes on the road. Others cut down branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Then the multitudes who went before and those who followed cried out, saying, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he had come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? So the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth of Galilee. Yeah, so, so here we have, these. this is the first place in the Gospels where you see that people are actually in the natural worshiping and glorifying Jesus as God. They're, they're, we, we celebrate it on Palm Sunday, and they laid the, the palm branches, their clothing, and they're worshiping him. Blessed Hosanna, blessed be the name of the Lord. What are they saying? Here's the Messiah, here comes our Savior. Wow, they recognized who he was. Here was the problem. 
Unlike the disciples that heard Jesus and went and got the donkey and the colt, they didn't hear what the Lord was doing. They wanted their way. The same people that is glorifying God right here are some of the same ones by the end of the week are saying crucify him. Why? Because Jesus wasn't who he said he was? Absolutely not. He was exactly who he said he was. But he didn't do it the way they thought he should do it. Listen, that's one of our first lessons in discipleship. Get over you and realize that God's got a better way. I know, and I'm not talking down to you. I'll use myself for example. Sometimes it just becomes a, a new revelation to me. He is so much smarter than me. Beyond even the comparison, there's no comparison. And so when God speaks something to you, God may say to some of you here today, you need to, you need, you've been watching that person in front of you, you need to tell them how much I love them. I love what Keith shared there, not withholding. I can so relate to that. There's been times in my life where I didn't withhold. There's been times where I did. But I'm telling you what, when you release what God's given you, it makes a huge difference. My wife released in a, in a meeting with all the volunteers yesterday what God had spoke to her. How many of you can give me an amen that it was good? Amen. Well, she, she wanted to withhold because she don't like to grab a microphone. <laughs> and But when she shared it, we were blessed. What you have from the Lord is just as blessed. What God says is blessed. They were saying, Hosanna. They were worshiping him, if you will, and then by the end of the week, they were hollering crucified, all because he didn't do it the way that they thought he should do it. What was they expecting? They were expecting him to come in to Jerusalem, set up the kingdom, overthrow, overthrow Rome, and live there. Now, here's the reality. He did overthrow Rome. He overthrew every government that will ever be, every king will bow their knee to Jesus, maybe a lot sooner than we used to think. Why? Because we're seeing clearly he knows what he's doing. He'd done that, but he didn't do it in the natural. He'd done it in the spirit. But the day will come when that will come to fruition, and he will be his kingdom on earth. Amen? And in heaven. And, and he is the king already. That's been accomplished. They just didn't know that at the time. We all could have fell into that same trap. Amen. But we have a more sure word of prophecy. We shouldn't be falling into it now. Peter said that. He said, we got a sure word of prophecy. We know the Bible. This is why we don't walk by uh, signs and, and, and confirmations. It's fine when you get one. But we walk by the word. Amen? If, if what you're hearing and what someone's saying to you or what you feel is not in line with the word, let it go until you get the word on it. Why? Because you can stand on this. Absolutely you can. And, and he'll give you a, a rhema word, but it won't contradict the logos word, the written word. Then Jesus went into the temple of God and drove out all those who bought and sold in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. And he said to them, It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. Then the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. But when the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things that he did and the children crying out in the temple and saying, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant and said to him, Do you hear what these are saying? And Jesus said to them, Yes. Have you never read out of the mouth of babes and nursing infants you have perfected praise? Then he left them and went out of the city to Bethany and he lodged there. Okay, so... Jesus goes into the temple, and you can just make a note if you make notes. Jesus didn't pay attention to the press. They were praising him, and they were exalting him and glorifying him, but he didn't let that take his mind off of what he needed to do. He went into that temple. One of the gospels says he took time to make a whip to drive the money changers out. Premeditated anger. But he never broke the word of God. Why? Because he got angry, holy indignation, but he didn't sin. He, why was he so upset? You have to understand a little bit about history of, of this time to understand the scripture here. 
The reason he was so upset is people were coming in from all over the world that holy week and they were buying, they didn't bring sacrifices, they were buying sacrifices to sacrifice unto the Lord. And the ones in charge, the the priest and the different ones in charge of the temple, they were charging double for some of these sacrifices, exuberant prices to these people that had traveled so far to worship the Lord. Not only that, you had to exchange whatever currency they used at that moment for the temple uh, uh, tokens, if you will, the temple money. And so they, the exchange rate, in other words, what they were given, maybe we'll use our economy so we understand it, what they were given could have been worth $20 and they were only giving them five. They were ripping them off. And Jesus immediately seen it, and he didn't care if he was praising him or not. He's like, hey, I'm going to deal with this. And he dealt with it. That's what he expects of us, not necessarily to turn over tables, but let me just say something in this crazy, woke society we live in. You can believe whatever you want to believe, but let me tell you something. Don't tell me what I need to believe. Uh, Where we got so far on that when I can... Hey, listen, leave Christianity out of it for a moment. Forget we're Christians. Where did it come all right morally in any respect, in any civilized society, when did it come all right for you to tell me what I had to believe or me to tell you what you had to believe? How did we get so far off of just common decency? Listen, I may preach what you need to believe, but you invited my opinion when you walked through the door. It's a whole different thing if I come knocking on your door and say, listen to me, Brad, you're going to hear what I got to say. That's a whole different thing together. Yeah. If I tell you, you've got to hear everything I say and do it, that's, that's wrong too. You need to hear God and go get the donkey in the cold, find your cord, and you'll please the Lord. Yeah. Amen? That's how we live. Jesus knew that. He didn't care what the leaders thought. He didn't care what society thought. Why? Because God the Father had already told him what he was supposed to do. Don't go to prayer giving God your list. Go to prayer and get God's list, and you'll live a very successful Christian life. It's already set up. God's not trying to keep things from us. He wants to speak to you. We've got, a, we got way too many, I mean, huge denominations telling people that God won't speak to them. Are people looking at you like you're crazy because God speaks to you? Well, listen, I've read the book. He said, my sheep know my voice. Well, if we know his voice, that means he's talking. Amen. And, and when I find it difficult to hear him, all I got to do is go in here, and I got a, this whole Bible here, 66 books, that he'll talk through every page. And then if I get really bogged down and don't think I can hear from him, I'll get in Proverbs, do one a day, and just let him speak through that. But he's always talking. And when we listen, it's an abundantly, above, exceedingly, words like that. You always have the victory. You triumph in everything you do. Why? It really is. I know it's a fictional thing, the Midas touch, but how many of you know Christianity is supposed to be that way? When we hear God first, I love what, we, me and Keith didn't talk about what he was going to share, but I love it when the Holy Ghost sets it up with Sheila or with him. Because here's the thing, God has been telling some of you for a long time, you need to offer forgiveness and you won't. Well, guess what? He's not obligated to do his part. There's some of you maybe watching online, God's told you to love that person and you're like, I can't do it. Well, you got to pull yourself in there and say, I can do it. I didn't say it was easy, I just said it was simple. What's simple about it? We just hear the voice of the Lord and follow it. James, he's already quoted, it, it's foolish to hear the word and then not respond to it. Yeah. Amen? But when, here's the thing I don't want you to miss. Listen to me if you miss everything else. God is not trying to get you and I to do something to beat us up. He's trying to get you and I to do whatever he's saying to us so that we can get in partnership and conquer whatever it is in front of us. Because when we're in partnership with the Lord and we are, and so obeying him, success comes. Now, here's the question that always rises up in people's heart and minds. I believe it does mine. What if I miss it? Don't worry about it. He'll find you. 
There is no condemnation to Christ Jesus. I'd rather miss God trying than to never try because you know you're not going to hit it. There's a bullseye. Just keep shooting at it. Me and the, two of the grandkids were shooting a BB gun yesterday. Man, I'm telling you what, they, they were having a time. But once they hit, it, hit the can a couple times, they didn't miss. They figured out what to do. Well, we, we figured out what to do. The disciples, says, Jesus said, just go. I'll take care of it. Well, he's going to take care of your, uh, this is a word for somebody, he's going to take care of your home if you'll give it to him. Yeah, it's not, it's not ours, it's his. He said, you've been bought with a very high price, his, his body, his life. If he bought you, how many of you know he'll take care of you? Yeah, you take care of that. I don't know how you are. I know I am. I, I think because I grew up fairly poor and I didn't have things that I wanted. When I get things now, man, I really take care of them. I don't mean this. I, I have no idea how old this suit of clothes is. I really don't. It's been a long time. I believe in stewarding whatever God blesses us with. And he'll bless you with more. Why? Because he owns you. I'm not my own. I've been bought with a very high price. Glorify God in your body. Amen? Let's keep going here. Now in the morning, as he returned to the city, he was hungry. And seeing a fig tree by the road, he came to it and found nothing on it but leaves and said to it, Let no fruit grow on you ever again. Immediately the fig tree withered away. And when the disciples saw it, they marveled, saying, How did the fig tree wither away so soon? So Jesus answered and said to them, Assuredly, I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what was done to the fig tree, but also if you say to this mountain, Be removed and be cast into the sea, it will be done. And whatever things you ask in prayer, believing, you will receive. Amen. Amen. What a promise. Let's break this down a little bit. Jesus is talking to fig trees. Do you ever read the Bible and just read it and you're like, hmm. Jesus is talking to a tree. I mean, you can read it to me, but it, isn't that what it says? I remember the first time this really became such a big thing for me and BB years ago. Pastor Whitfield had a word that Sunday morning. He said, there's some of you here you need to go home, lay hands on your checkbook, and talk to it. We hadn't been going there too long and. It was a weird thing. I can still see us doing it. M many of you have heard this story. We had the little pull out on the roll top desk. We laid the checkbook there and we laid our hands on it. We came in agreement with each other. We came in agreement with God's word, with the word the prophet spoke. We come in agreement with all of that and we commanded the checkbook to line up with God. Why? Because he said, I will prosper you. I will bless you. That's what he declares. Exceedingly abundantly above anything you could ever ask, hope, or think. I knew what he said. But it was weird to lay hands on a checkbook and talk to it. And then the Lord gave us a revelation. Even years later, we, we reheard the revelation. The checkbook had been talking to us. Why not talk back? Yeah. What had the checkbook been saying? You're broke. <laughs> and you got to watch what's talking to you is boisterous and louder than what you're talking back. Jesus seen that fig tree, it wasn't no fruit on it. What was he really given the illustration? Two things, it's twofold revelation or illustration parable. What was it? One, he was about to show them what he had just done with the money changers. What he's also going to do throughout his ministry is he's going to let people know when you try to build a religious system without Jesus, without the Holy Spirit in the middle of it, I've got no use for it. Why does God hate man-made religion? Because he ain't in it. He died for us. It ain't a religion. It's a way of life. It is the way, the truth, the life. It ain't something somebody sat around the boardroom and said, oh, let's do this, let's do this, let's do this. We'll get the right actor. We'll put them up front, and this will be a religion. No, he died for us. He said, I don't like this. Why? Because there's no fruit that comes off of that tree. 
The fruit comes from us doing what the two disciples do, responding to the Word of God. That day we laid our hands on the checkbook. B.B. always likes for me to finish that story. Our finances wasn't worked out the next day. But I did receive a word pretty quickly after praying. I didn't like it, but I received it. First thing he said to me, and I knew his voice, put the credit card up. I'm like, man, he is no fun at all. <laughs> For the first time in my life, I've got, I've got decent credit. At least I got a credit card. And now I can't use it. I mean, no sense of humor at all. And Bibi's just grinning because I think she already had the word. She had already said this, and I, no offense to you ladies, please, if you got any, take it with Bibi. But she said to me, she said, you like to shop and spend money more than any woman I've ever met. <laughs> Guilty. That's why I still have clothes in my closet from years ago. It's full because I love to shop. I used to, not so much no more. A little personal there, isn't it? But when we put the credit card up, here's the point you don't want to miss. I'm having a little fun, but don't miss this. One step toward God will cause him to move mountains in your direction. All I'd done was put up the credit card, and I'm telling you what, things began to change quickly. Now, they still didn't get to where they're at today. It was a process. Why? Have you ever heard the term, and, and, and please understand this, you build wealth that don't fall from the sky. But God will give you the creative means whereby to obtain it. He'll give you ideas you didn't even know you had. Need I repeat the movie? A duck call? I don't know what they're worth. Millions. They call it a dynasty. I'm sure it's worth more than 100,000. Amen? And many of them going on to preach the gospel. That's the point. See, God will create an audience for you. He doesn't give you the wealth so you can go tell all, all your neighbors and family how well off you are. I ain't got nothing to do with it. He gives it to you to show that he's the blesser, not the cursor. And most of our blessings are not even so much about us being blessed as it is remembering who gave them to us. Because I was just as thankful for the Lord when the checkbook was zero or in the red. Why? Because he had saved me. For the first time in my life, I could lay down on a pillow of a night and not think about where I was going to wake up. There's no money, there's no material blessing nowhere of any kind. Dubai, you can go to the richest places. I've been to Naples, Florida, richest real estate in America at one time. I promise you, the houses there, the different things, nothing compares to knowing that it's well with your soul. He said, what profit a man if he gained the whole world and lose his soul? So let's don't never get it out of perspective. God wants to bless you. But always remember this. Most of his blessing, because he loves you, but also he wants to give you a voice with the people around you. When I see people succeeding in life, I want to know what they're doing. Well, guess what? Your neighbors do too. Don't withhold it. Tell them how God has blessed you. The, the other thing, or the, 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 the thing here is, um, he said, if you'll speak to the mountain, you'll be removed. H how many of you, let's just have a, just a little chat here just for a second and, and just be honest at Sunday morning. How many of you have had a, uh, had a little bit of a problem with this teaching about speaking to your mountain at some point? Yeah. yeah. It, don't condemn yourself because you have that problem. It comes from a place of integrity. Yeah comes from a place of integrity. So don't beat yourself up. Get over it, but don't beat yourself up. What's the integrity? Because you, you really have a hard time saying something that's not what, that, that you can't see. So all I'm going to do is change your eyesight for a moment. You get it off of what you're looking at and put it on this. If he said it, it's true. If you go to God and he gives you a word, that settles it. He said, if you'll take the steps, I'll build the church. That settled it. No more concern about him building this building. When he built it, he built it. He built it debt-free. Why? Because he told me he would. When he said there is no plan B, that settled it. Why? Because he's God. 
Now, I had several confirmations to that. I believe God when he said it, but God is so gracious and so kind. I flew all the way to Colorado Springs for a meeting, and the first thing out of the pastor's mouth that serves on our board here, first words out of his mouth, I hadn't even talked to him. I hadn't even discussed it with him at that point. First words out of his mouth is, he said, I hate debt, and God don't even like us to use it if we don't have to. I'm like, okay, God, I get it. Originally, I was going out there so he could introduce me to his banker. I'm telling you, God is faithful. But speak to your mountain. Someone was sharing with me before service how, how, how difficult it is sometimes just to, you, you get something coming on you. Be a head cold sign. How difficult it is to say, I'm healed. I walk in divine health. You say, does that really matter? Yes, the checkbook lined up, your body will too. And if you don't believe things talk to you, just listen. Here's, a, here's an experiment you can try just to validate the word. I, not that you don't trust me, not that you don't believe me, but just this will really give you a validation. Today or tomorrow, say, say tomorrow morning, uh, go on a fast for breakfast. Everything in your refrigerator, everything in your cabinet will start screaming at you. Eat me, please. Get. Or if you go on a diet and you say no sugar in your diet or no sweet, oh, that's the one over the top. I've had oatmeal cookies dance in front of me, I believe. <laughs> and all of a sudden it comes in your mind. This is how strong the language is. You can taste it and you haven't even opened it. Is that not true? Well, guess what? In the same reaction... It can go the other way. You can speak into your future. Mark eleven twenty two. have faith in God. Whatsoever you believe in your heart, that's the place to start. And speak with your mouth, that's what you'll have. How do we get the belief in our heart? We don't ask God for more faith. We take the unbelief that the world gives us, the situation gives us, we wash it out with belief, the truth. The only way to replace unbelief is put belief in. You don't pray it out. This has caused the church a lot of problems. You'll come to altars, even get people, anoint them with oil and lay hands on them. Pray for me that I'll have more faith. It don't work. I mean, let's face it, if we could pray that prayer over anybody, us preachers would start with ourselves. No, the only way to get rid of unbelief is to wash it out with belief. You're a product, I'm a product of what goes into my mind. I'm old enough, I'm dating myself here a little bit. I remember when computers first started hitting the scene. There was a famous slogan that went along with them. You put the good stuff in, you get the good stuff out. Greatest computer ever invented, it was invented by God. If you don't believe it, you can walk in a room today and pick up a smell that you remember when you was a kid, and all of a sudden you're back in that experience. You can get in your car today and a song come on. You'll and, and if it's an old song, it'll come on and you'll remember what car you was driving and who you was dating when you heard it. It'll call to remembrance things. Smells, tastes, feelings, sounds. Well, guess what? That same mind can be put in gear around God's word and speak their future. You're a speaking spirit. Speak today. Walk in divine health. Walk in the prosperity of God. Why? Because he gave it to us. Let's finish up. Just a couple more here. Now when he came into the temple, the chief priest and the elders of the people confronted him as he was teaching and said, By what authority are you doing these things, and who gave you this authority? But Jesus answered and said to them, I also will ask you one thing, which if you tell me, I likewise will tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John, where was it from? From heaven or from men? And they reasoned among themselves, saying, If we say from heaven, he will say to us, Why then did you not believe him? But if we say from men, we fear the multitude, for all count John as a prophet. So they answered Jesus and said, We do not know. And he said to them, Neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. Check this out. These are the religious leaders, and they turn right there at the last verse. They lie to Jesus. You say, what do you mean they lie? They knew what authority he came from. They believed John. They believed he was from God. Now, look at, watch this. The wisdom of God. Jesus didn't lie to them. 
he corrected their lie and spoke truth. Look what he said. He said, neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. In other words, he said, I'm making a decision. You made one. He didn't even have to tell them they lied. They knew. You don't have to always tell people what they're doing. They know. What did Jesus do here, though? This is masterful. If you own a business, you're in a family, always remember your greatest asset is to ask questions. We were having our meeting yesterday, and I was telling uh, Keith and Jeff, I worked for Pastor Barr at Agape for years. We worked in the discipleship classes when we was going there. I worked with him in the Bible college for years. He was my, uh, he had authority over me. I submitted to him. He was one of the easiest people I ever submitted to. You know why? He was constantly, and to this day, if we in a conversation, we won't be in it more than two minutes, he'll be asking me what I think. Why is that important? Because I feel like I'm part of his world. I'm not just some subject that gets something done. When you ask questions, you can straighten out all kinds of things. Jesus just asked a simple question. By what authority did John do it? What was he? And you, you, she read the story. They knew either way they answered it. They were nailed. Why? Because Jesus turned the table on them. Listen, he'll do that for you. When you get in a, a tough situation, he'll turn the table for you. Here's how you know it's God. You'll say something out of your mouth and you'll realize that was not me. My intellect is not there. I've said things. I said it earlier. I don't even remember now what it was. And I was like, wow, that's good. Oh, about the ownership and the stewardship. You know when God's speaking to you. When you ask questions, he'll speak to you. Just a quick recap, real quick. Remember this. Whatever God tells you you can do, you can do it. Don't forget that. When you and I do what God says do, he'll bless it. He has no choice, not because we don't give him a choice, but because he, not, he didn't give himself a choice. He said, I put my word above my name. So if God gives you his word on something, you got it. Once you get that, don't let no one talk you out of it. Don't let them praise you and then tell you you ought to do something different. The enemy's very conniving, very sneaky. He'll get somebody to, to make you feel real warm and fuzzy, and then all of a sudden they talk you out of their blessing because they want you to do it their way. Don't do that. And then when you get that settled in your heart and you go to God and get his list, you hold on to it. Don't try to give it to someone else, but you hold on to it and you believe for that list. You believe for what God told you you can do. I remember Chad sitting there. I remember years ago, he, Chad was about 16 or 17, something like that. And he's always been kind of fly by the seat of his pants. I don't know where he gets that from. But he made a decision. He heard me teach it or somebody teach it, I guess. And he said, whatever you commit to the Lord will succeed. And he had his own little business card. So I still got it somewhere, Chad. And didn't have nothing but just a word from God. No, no equipment, no nothing. And started a landscaping business. And done well with it. Same thing when he went into heavy equipment. He didn't have no heavy equipment. But he trusted God. You can trust God. He'll give you the power to get wealth. He'll, he'll help you in life. And I'm not talking about exorbitant, uh, exuberant amounts of money. That may be some of you. Some of you have got the gift of giving. You need that. I was just talking to someone the other day, someone locally here that just donated $1.7 million to an organization. Well, listen, when you make that kind of money, you can do that, and you can help a lot of people. Just trust God, get his list, follow it, and then when you get his list, don't you let nobody or no thing talk you out of speaking that list. Be selective of who you tell it to. Why? Why would you invite trouble? Because nobody will ever believe in your vision like you will. You tell, you tell your neighbor, all my kids are going to serve the Lord with gladness. The next week, they tell you everything your little kid done. Why? The enemy will work through people to talk you out of what God said to you. Don't let him do it. Don't let that happen. Select the people that have your heart. Get them in agreement with you and go for whatever God tells you. Amen. Y'all receive this this morning. Father, we love you. We thank you so much for the simplicity of your word. Lord, we know sometimes because we're in a fight and we're soldiers that it's not necessarily easy, but it is simple. And so, Lord, we follow that simplicity, and we will hear you and speak what you say. 
and we will have what you say. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen.